And Senator Cantwell, the leader of, uh, of the effort on the Export-Import Bank and particularly raising that question of the small companies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to associate my uh, comments uh, with the member from Georgia because I think Senator Isaacson hit the nail right on the head. Um, you guys have clearly outlined what we need to be doing, and um, we here need to do our job. I think so many people think that we're somehow helping U.S. manufacturing when all we're doing is delaying the certainty and predictability that they need to compete. They have to focus every single day on shipping product. That's the level of competition that they face. So they're so busy focused on shipping product, we think they should take time away from that competition and come and run around the halls here and explain to us in intimate detail things that we can't understand. I'd rather them be competitive and ship their product and us do our job. So first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Zell, for um, clearly articulating that the health of U.S. manufacturing depends on exports. I don't think we can emphasize that enough, that the market is outside the United States of America. Um, I have a question, though. I, I, your testimony, I think I, I'm trying to understand the upside and the downside in manufacturing. So I think you're saying, well, let me try this. So we used to have about 18 million manufacturing jobs in the United States. That's correct. Okay, and we lost six million, so we're down down to about twelve or thirteen. Twelve point one million, yes. Okay, so we're at twelve. Okay, what's the upside for us, and what's the risk side? By that I mean, how big of an upside do you think we have in manufacturing? I'm not asking for like an exact, precise number, but if we go and capture, I know from aviation, we have a world demand for thirty-five thousand new airplanes. That's a lot of jobs. So, but. We got to build them. We have to compete. We have to have the export import bank to sell them. All of that. So, what what do you think the upside is for the U.S. economy on manufacturing if we proceed correctly? I think the upside is at least three to five million more U.S. manufacturing jobs. And the key point of my testimony uh, was that we cannot rely on market forces and lower production costs alone, though they are important, but they will not be sufficient to ensure a U.S. manufacturing renaissance without these types of proactive public policies around trade and technology that we've been talking about here today. One key point I'd just like to make. Well, in our calling please, card, all, our calling card in the competitive arena is our ability to innovate, correct? Our ability to innovate next generation faster than anybody else, right? That's precisely right. Okay. And, and our ability to do so uh, depends on three conditions existing in global marketplaces. Uh, first, the existence of large markets, because our innovative products like aircraft and semiconductors have very high fixed cost of initial design and development, so their marginal costs need to be spread across larger global markets. That doesn't happen when other countries are closed to our exports. Uh, intellectual property theft then becomes a key threat to our ability to innovate because so much of our innovation is knowledge and, and resource intensive. And then when you get excess competition in the global economy, for example, uh, India recently issued a compulsory license for Bayer's Nexavar, uh, an anti-cancer drug, uh, and that's going to allow an Indian manufacturer to now produce a generic copy. So that create, creates excess competition in the global economy, which prevents our manufacturers not only from competing, but from then generating profits from one generation of innovation that can be reinvested into the future. So, so getting uh, no excess competition, access to large markets, and protection of intellectual property right in the global economy is the key thing we have to do to assure American innovation. Well, I appreciate your speed there. Thank you. Um, but what's the downside? Because if the upside is, if we're at 12 million and the upside is another 3.5 or higher, what's the downside if we don't act? What happens to that 12 million? Well, when you consider that we lost a third of our manufacturing jobs in the prior decade, if we don't get our act right, uh, we could lose uh, at least 20 uh, to 30 percent uh, in the coming decade. That's not inevitable. Uh, it shouldn't happen. It doesn't have to happen. Uh, but just very briefly, if you look back to the year 1997, the U.S. has lost 43 percent of its manufacturing jobs when creating for labor force growth. Germany has only lost 8 percent over that time. So Germany's put in place a right set of policies to support the export economy. We need to be thoughtful about looking at what other countries are doing smartly and, and how we can em emulate such policies in the United States. I don't, I don't know where else that, you know, we can be so accountable for an upside of 3 5 million or a loss of 3.5 million. So, I mean, to me, I, as I said, I think my colleague, Senator Isaacson, got it right. I did want to just put up two charts quickly to your earlier point. Um, 
This is the U.S. aerospace supply chain, and you can see that it has companies in every state in the United States. In fact, we're passing out uh, for our colleagues today uh, data and information about the supply chain companies that exist in their area. And then the second chart is just the actual XM larger supply chain, which is 33,000 companies. So, uh, and it shows by state each of those uh, states and where these manufacturing jobs are. So, um, there's a lot at stake all throughout the United States. I don't think people, uh, I noticed when I handed Senator Schumer his handout yesterday, he was delighted to see that there were more uh, supply chain manufacturers in his state than in mine. So I think, <laughs> I think that you can see that it's all across the United States of America. And this is why we have to get this policy right. And this is why we have to move forward on the Exim Bank and these other policies we've discussed here today. So thank you. Uh, if I could just make note, even though our primary product is consumer electronics, we do supply component parts to the manufacturers for both aerospace and automotive. So we have, we, you know, internally we innovate these little ideas and it's picked up and so it ends up being little parts inside of big parts that end up flying or driving. Which, I, if I could just mention one last point, I think our colleagues just really need to understand what Mr. Kimber just said. Our competitive advantage is that the small companies are continuing to perfect the innovation. So it's flat organizations continuing to be the best experts at their particular area. That's why we can innovate faster. But it's a very spread across the United States thing. And so just because you don't hear from them doesn't mean they don't exist and they aren't producing great product. We have to empower them. If I may make one last comment relative to the downside. Um, I, I agree with Mr. Ezel that there, there is a meaningful downside, but I want to express that our international competitors are not standing still. So we may have experienced something from 1997 until now, but competition is accelerating. And as preferential policies are being established by uh, international governments, they are facilitating even greater acceleration there. So we must really act.